right, everybody, welcome to another edition of the New Breed Show. This is uh, the world's most unique music show, talking about everything brutal, new death, hard slam, grind, thrash, core metal. I am one half of your hosting duo, Jay Horsecow. With me, I have the partner, my partner in crime, the notorious TIM, Tim Anderson Jr. Tim, how you going? Great. I, th- I thought I would wear my Adidas one for this tonight. Very, very fitting. Very fitting. Yeah, and definitely. with us... Um, we have a collaboration partner in crime, uh, the host of the Life is Peachy podcast, coming to us straight from Australia, uh, Mr. David Owen Blackley. David, thank you so much for joining. Pleasure. I've really been looking forward to this. We are <laughs> glad to have you. So for our listeners, for our watchers, um, this came about, I think it was kind of by accident. David started commenting on some of our stuff. We commented some of his stuff and we reached out. We said, hey, why don't we get together and why don't we do an episode? Um, because this way we can chat with each other, do a little bit of exploration, maybe melt some of the fan bases, right? Maybe introduce some of us to some of David's work in Life and Peachy and vice versa. Uh, and we decided, well, what are we going to talk about? We need something as a baseline because otherwise three dudes sitting around talking about new metal is, well, it sounds like most of our episodes, but that's besides the point. So <laughs> the baseline for this episode is we are going to a deep dive into, I believe it is 2002. Do I have the year right? Uh, 2000. 2000. I was off by two years. 2000. Uh, Taproot's debut album, Gift. So we've all listened to this a couple of times. Um, We're going to go track by track like we typically do. But first, David, I want to give you a chance uh, for our listeners that may not be familiar with you, uh, your show, what you do. I want to give you a chance to, how about you steal the mic? Um, Give us a little bit of background yourself, but also let's talk a little bit about the show. Yeah, thanks. Fantastic. Well, I have a business doing music videos and music documentaries called Her Name is Murder Productions. And essentially COVID hit and I wasn't touring. I wasn't being able to do my passion, do what I love. Yeah, I was thinking, okay, something's missing. I'm feeling really off. What is that? And essentially it was sharing stories through uh, the connection of music. And when I was thinking, what can I do to fulfill this void? The podcast idea came up and I had never thought about anything like this ever before. And also I'm very much used to being behind the camera. So even doing something like this is really, really different for me. And I had to get over that hurdle of self-confidence, essentially, and put myself out there. But I was lucky enough to get the podcast up off the ground because I had worked with clients through Her Name is Murder Productions. So that's how I was able to come straight off the bat with Derek Green from Sepultura, Jeff Irwin from Wilhaven, and had some friends in other bands. And then I was able to kind of get it going from there. And essentially, it's just a trip down memory lane, albums that mean the world to me. And this era of music, predominantly, you know, if we could say around the 20 year mark ago, where there's a lot of love and there's a lot of connection. This is a perfect example of it. It's just a time that really resonated with a lot of people. And so the podcast is just a celebration of these albums. And I do every episode with a guest from that album and we deep dive into the era of that band's career. I do put a lot of myself in there as well because I love hearing other people's stories uh, that aren't musicians but fans of the music and it's not for everyone in that respect because I do do a lot of sound design and I do add a lot of things but I try to create an audio documentary. I'm mimicking really what I did with Her Name Is Murder but in the audio podcast format. Awesome. And, and for all of our listeners, watchers, please do check out David's show. He does, a, he does a masterful job editing everything. There's sound clips, there's samples, whenever there's a reference you hear it in the background. Um, and it makes, for, it, does, it makes for an interesting listen. It makes for something that you really got to gotta kind of pay attention to yeah. because it, you'll, 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 miss, you'll miss a second. And those are like, was that Ghostbusters? And then you got to go back and it's, but it really is a, it's a fun listen. So we're, we're excited to have David on because um, we, you know, we, we're trying to spread the love here. And it's funny because we all kind of started, there were a lot of um, new metal. I won't say revival, well, revival, nostalgia, memorabilia, just um, like you said, we're at the 20 year mark out. And a lot of us, it was, it was important music. It was an influential time. So a lot of us all started at the same time and, and us here at Newbury, we were like, Hey, you know, let's reach out to some of the other podcasts, and do some fun stuff. Because honestly, we we're all sharing the same baseline interest. So we can have a go of it. Right. And you know, uh, and everybody does things a little bit differently, which is what kind of makes it fun. Totally. <laughs> so let's dive in. Tim, give us some of the background on, on Taproot's 2000 album, Gift. Uh, released June 27, 2000 <clears throat> on Atlantic and Velvet Hammer, which Velvet Hammer, I 
do not remember that label at all. Do you guys? It was an imprint, but I forget who owned the imprint. I, I, I'm i not sure. I remember when I read it, I was like, Velvet Hammer. I don't even remember that label. But, of course, I remember Atlantic. Um, produced by Ulrich Wilde, which very surprised me as well. Mm. But <clears throat> when you listen to the record, you kind of hear it. Because the production is, I think, kind of masterful on this record. I think it complements the band perfectly. To tell you the truth, the more I listen to it, I mean, I loved it back in the day, but as we started deep diving it, like in the last couple of weeks, I'm like, the, the production of this record is dead fucking on. Mm-hmm. I think, um, it, it is. It's not their first record, but it's their debut main major label, record. right? Major yeah. label record, yeah. So. And I think I was very surprised at how many copies this sold, which was 250,000. Yeah, that's which not bad. Is crazy because it's like new metal back then in 2000. I would think more like 98, you would get 250,000, but 2000 after oh, Slipknot already did it. Yep. Shit like that. You know what I mean? So, and also I was very surprised to see they're out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. So it's like, which is an interesting locale. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting locale. Yeah. So it's just a lot of crazy facts on this record. I couldn't find too many facts about it, or I couldn't find enough facts about it is what I'm trying to say. That's why I'm hoping you guys know a little bit more. Well, so. I, I'm going to throw it over to David and say, David, you know, how did you come across this band, this album? What was your experience? Yeah, well, um, another interesting fact I could have the number wrong, but I believe they signed at the time. It was a seven album contract straight up with Atlantic, which seems crazy. <laughs> I, I think I had that somewhere, actually. That's insane. Yeah, and I think they made it three albums before Parting Ways. I think the label kept believing they were going to be one of the next big bands, and they did, of course, have a lot of success for a new metal band, but I think they were always hoping the next record was going to be the platinum record, and they were always really close to getting there. Never quite happened. But for me, when I first heard Gift, it would have been the music video for Again and Again. We have this music video program in Australia. It's still going. It's called Rage. And they would have for about one to two hours between 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. on a Friday and Saturday night. It would be allocated just for heavy music stuff. So I would pre-program the VHS player to record Rage. And then the next morning, I would watch the music videos And that's how I came across again and again. And yeah, instantly drawn to the vocal, his interplay between the singing, the screaming, catchy hooks. I'm a sucker for a good opening riff. The bouncier, the better. So it kind of ticked all these boxes for me. And it had that sweet early 2000s new metal color grade that was present on so many music videos as well. And so I was like, yeah, sweet, I'm in. (laughs) Got the album when it came out. (laughs) Absolutely. I, I kind of think that maybe they were just a victim of being a year or two too late, yeah. right? Because their their major label debut comes out in 2000. The second album comes out in 2002. And by that point, things had basically crested, right? They were on the, the two, well, 20, <laughs> we talked, you know, funnily enough, we interviewed uh, the guys from Crossbreed last night. And they talked about how 9-11 was just destroyed all these different bands, all the momentum they had, all these different tours. And, you know, after 2002, the new metal is cresting. It's on its way out. The pop tarts like the Britney Spears and the Christina are really starting to get some play. And you start to have, um, for I guess the next big thing in extreme music was kind of the metalcore stuff, right? As I Lay Dying, Kill Switch Engage, the new wave of American heavy metal, that started to be the, you know, the ascendant um, trend in guitar-based stuff. So they were just, I think they were just a little a year or two too late. Figure, figure them on, on OzFest 99 as opposed to OzFest 2001. And you end up probably with a much different, a much different uh, ending to that tale. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. I think I completely agree with that. You know, there was such a great band in terms of songwriting and progression as well between albums. Like they progressed really lovely, whether it was for everyone or not. That's another point, but they were just great songwriters, plain and simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they definitely were going the more rock route as they, you know, matured, if you want to say. Yeah. Especially what what was that? What was the big song off of the record after this? Um, poem. 
poem. That's it. Yeah. Yep. That's a that was a huge song when it came out. Mm-hmm. It was massive. There's this thing here. So originally they were supposed to get signed to Interscope because they sent demos to their demo to Fred Durst. Yep. And uh he was supposed to work on something and uh apparently somebody crossed him and he left them like a nasty voicemail. And they they transcribed it on Wikipedia. It's it's pretty hilarious. It, wasn't that at. on the original album? That was the outro, wasn't it? Oh, wasn't was there it? a hidden track? I could swear. I mean, I'd have to dig out my CD copy because now all I have is like the copy of Spotify. But I am ninety nine point nine percent sure that recording is the outro or a hidden track on the first pressing of that album. I think I got to dig it out, but I think. gonna have to go to Soul Seek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, it also right. it exists on YouTube as well. If anyone's curious, you can find it on YouTube. Oh, so Jay was right. Okay. Yeah, it's it's definitely out there. Yeah. Yeah, he he was uh, apparently like they were they started talking with Atlantic at the same time and Durst was like pissed off about it or something. Yep. Yeah, he cursed at him because I think they went to uh they went away from an interscope went to Atlantic. Yep. Yeah, and then apparently he kicked system of a down off of uh, family values and all that shit. So I'm assuming Taproot was probably going to get a little slot on there too, and he he got all pissed off. <laughs> probably, yeah, probably. Yeah, we we we, we sh- I wish we could have found that and played that voicemail. We should try. I, sh- I should try and look for it on YouTube while we're talking. Um, you know, funnily enough, it's it's not this album, but I remember. Didn't they cover? What did they cover, Tim? We did that episode where we did all the new metal covers, and it was a surprise on their first independent album what oh they covered um uh is it get out of my dreams get into my car yes yes it is <laughs> yes <laughs> on, on something more than nothing they covered get out of my dreams and get into my car and i found that and i was like wait a minute no this isn't the song that i'm thinking about isn't it but yeah which is kind of why kind of why yeah, right so a couple more things here tracks two six seven and nine are older demo tracks we recorded for this release they came from the two demos before this, which was something more than nothing, and then upon us. So it's ninety eight, ninety nine. Um, I gotta, I gotta pull them out. I guess they're on Soul Seek too. But apparently, the whole record was done already done like three years prior to this. So I guess they went in the studio and just wrote. They wrote "Drag Down." That was like literally the only track that they wrote in studio for this record specifically, which is crazy because now that we're talking about it, like you guys were saying. They might have been a year or two late, but if they would have put it out in 97, do you think that they would have jumped like a bigger, Yeah, you know what I mean? They wouldn't have plateaued maybe? Yeah, I think yeah. maybe they might have been considered more innovative if it came out earlier, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. Like, like, like David said, the whole, and what caught, catches me all, also when I listen to it, it's the whole singing and screaming vibe that he does because he does, I mean, even live, he could pull it off perfectly. Yeah, which was impressive to me. So, I mean, I'm assuming he probably did that in the studio as well, like singing it. So if he did, I mean, shout out to him, man. But I think what I, what I was trying to say is I think if they would have released it, say, 97, 98, I think you get a bigger you get a bigger a push bump. for them. You get a bigger sale going on and all that stuff, like sell sale of records. My bad. I'm exhausted tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, I mean, did they did Ozfest 2000, right? Was it 2000 or 2001? I think it was 2000. (sighs) Pull up the wiki. (laughs) Was it? It wasn't 99. I think it was 2000. Let me look here. Uh... Yeah, while you're looking for that, one more. So they also re released the record with as a Japanese bonus track called Day by Day, uh, which I've heard and is very good track. Yes. One of their best, I reckon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really good. I'm surprised it wasn't on the record record, but I guess back then you also had all that stuff. Like you would get a re, or you would get a special release for certain countries and stuff. I don't really see that happening too much anymore. No, yeah, like it was always the Japanese edition. Day by Day was also a B side on the Again and Again single, and it was also on the Dracula 2000 soundtrack. That's how I found it. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, in the era where our soundtracks were just amazing, full of all that B-side content, unreleased stuff. Oh, I got to check that out. I got to check it. Tim, you were right. It is 2000 and 2001. They were on oh, okay. the second stage in both years. And I, if I remember correctly, I saw them in 2001 because I think I got, I got a free ticket 
because I pre-ordered the Slipknot Iowa album from yeah. Sam Goody. Yep. So I got a free ticket. Um, yeah, because that was the year uh, Hate Breed, Union Underground, um, Drowning Pool, uh, where Dave Williams passed, Spine Shank, the whole nine. Yeah. Okay. Did Ozfest go through Australia at all? I lived uh, Ozfest out through looking at it in magazines. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> Never made it. Mm. But you, you, you guys have the what's that big one over there? It's not download. It's a uh, big day out, which was big good day for out, a while. Yeah, yeah. And, and then uh, Soundwave Festival. I was just gonna say Soundwave, but I didn't want to sound like an asshole if it was. So- <laughs> <laughs> I I could have swore I could have swore that was Soundwave was the one over there, but it could have worked over there though. I think I think it would have worked for like a three day Oz Fest over there. I think it would have worked. Oh, dude, especially at that point in time. I mean, the new metal stuff was huge here in Australia. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, it's it's not surprising at all that it was huge there either. Mm. Mm. Um, oh, you know, we could talk a lot about the Australian music scene because there's really interesting stuff that comes out of there, right? Like, it seems like a, a sound, um, like some of the stuff with, uh, what was it, I Killed the Prom Queen, and oh, then yeah. some of that stuff where the, there's a sound that almost gestates, and Parkway then when it explodes, I guess. Yeah, Parkway Drive, when it explodes into the mainstream, everybody's following behind it. But David, let me ask you, what part of Australia are you from? Are you in the uh, southeast or is right where most of the people are, right? The southeast, southeastern corner? Yeah, so I am uh, I come from the state of Queensland and the city of Brisbane, which is on the east coast. So you got Brisbane and then the next one is Sydney and then Melbourne. And that's all down okay. the east coast. Okay. But since 2014, I've been living overseas. I live in the Netherlands at the moment, but I try to come back to Australia every year to shoot music videos and to see family and friends. So that's why I don't have my normal setup with me at the moment, because I'm kind of just got my backpack and I'm <laughs> visiting home. So <laughs> Gorilla podcasting. And, and David, um, for, for our listeners and fans that don't really know geography, like the, the difference between the eastern side and the western side of Australia is huge, right? There, it is. I mean, how far is it if you're going from like Brisbane to what's on the on the west? Is that is that Canberra? Is that what's all the way over on the west? So the west coast is uh, Western Australia, and the city, the main city capital, is Perth. A direct okay. flight from Brisbane Airport to Perth Airport, you're looking at about four to five hours. So bad. it's. It's significant though. Like Tim, it's like you or I going outside. What is that? Chicago? Is no, Chicago hey, for? We could get to LA in five hours. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. So, but it's it, still, it's deceptively big, right? Like that's not yeah, like, yeah, it's, it's not like going from country, New Jersey yeah. to Philly to, to PA to DC. It's, it's a much bigger, a much bigger um, landmass. Well, Jay, I'm curious why you asked if, or why you said most people live in the Southeast is, is, and then I thought about it is most, most of the country is just like woodsy, right? Well, it is, it's, it's huge, right? Australia is an old oh, David. Well, here I am talking about your, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like if, if you think about it, most of the center of Australia is just desert desert. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. Yeah. Desert. That's what I meant. And then yeah, the East coast and the West coast, you're right in what you were saying, particularly with the East coast, which is Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, that's where like you know a huge chunk of the population is i mean it's just better living conditions you're not in the desert <laughs> so uh okay. you guys have too many creatures over there i'm good i, I am i am my convinced, ass in philly i am convinced the toughest people on the planet are the australians the toughest people on this planet are the australians because not only did the, the country start as a penal colony right so remember that literally almost all the flora and fauna is trying to kill you at any given moment Yep. The cassowaries, the Portuguese man of war, the dingoes, the snakes, the scorpions. Like, these are tough people. Like, these are tough people who have fought nature for, for hundreds of years. Like, God bless them, right? Like, God bless them. It's definitely like the question I get asked most overseas when I meet anyone. They're like, whoa, you're from Australia. How do you survive? But <laughs> that would be me. <laughs> if you grow up in the city, there might be some spiders, maybe some snakes. But I mean, I've never had any unlucky encounters. The most dangerous thing for me is a magpie. It's a particular bird. And when they give birth and they have their babies in the trees, they become like missiles. And as a kid, you're riding your BMX bike to school and you hear it first. And it's like, and they just go. Wow. They try to like get in your eye and rip you apart. 
And as a kid, that scarred me for life. I still have, like, <laughs> trauma from magpies. <laughs> I gotta look that up now. Well, that's wild. Yeah, I come outside and there's a taipan staring at me. I'm, <laughs> I'm fucking out, dude. <laughs> Yeah, Tim is uh Tim is gonna retire to somewhere in the middle of Texas where it's warm, there's no snow, and anything you see, you can see coming and shoot it with a shotgun and get away. With Absolutely. It. Yep. You're you're 100 percent correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get into this record. But first I want to say how many bands and Jay knows this firsthand tried to rip this sound off after this. A million, dude. Everybody, right? it's crazy, everybody. man. Everybody. Uh we did when well, we did that underground new metal deep dive. Um David, you might have heard a bunch of these bands. I, I put them in two buckets, and, and it's the biggest compliment I can pay Taproot. And the other band is Primer 55. Yeah. Because after a certain point, everybody fell into the Taproot bucket, which is Sing Scream, decent songs, uh, decent songwriting, right? Like traditional songer structures. And then there was the Primer 55 bucket, which was straight up aggro, new metal bro energy. And it kind of got binary. For a point, there was a dichotomy where you either went this way or you went that way. Yep. You were either getting loose or you were singing, screaming, and everybody <laughs> ripped off the sound. Loose. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to, I want to, I'll start with David. Did this record, does this record hold up for you twenty years later? I was excited to do this episode with you guys because actually, straight up, I'm a pretty big Taproot fan. Also, with a lot of their other work, my favorite Taproot album is actually Blue Sky Research, and that was wow. their last one on Atlantic, but. I think I just really appreciate them as progressive songwriters. Yeah, I don't know. You never forget your first, right? Like I found Taproot because mm -hmm. of this album. So it's got a lot of bang for buck still. There's huge riffs. There's some really amazing hooks. It's not my favorite Taproot album, but it still holds a real special place in my heart for sure. For a band that I really enjoy in general. It definitely. Yeah. I mean, when I listen to it, I'm like, yeah, this record holds up perfectly for me. I could, <laughs> this will be a record I listen to all the time though. Uh, this is, this is best exemplified by Jordan, uh, Jordan Sloan from Zone Zero's quote, where he says, people forget that one of the draws of new metal is a lot of those bands wrote good songs. Mm. And yeah. these guys write good songs. It Memorable, wasn't all, yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't all aesthetics. It wasn't all like tropey new metal stuff. Like they literally write well-structured songs. One of, one, of my, one of the cons for that, which we'll talk about when we get into the, my, the, when we start going song by song is, it can get a little bit repetitive because they write songs so well and in, in a recognizable structure that you kind of sort of get deja vu. But again, solid songwriting, solid musicianship. Uh, before we started recording, David called it, but he said, you know, the guitar tone is just unreal. So yeah, there's some, there's some good gems on this. All right, Tim, uh, let's, let's dive in. So here we go. The first song on this album uh, is uh, the lead off song is smile three minutes and 34 seconds. So I'm going to start with you, David, um, by asking, did you, were you aware of these guys before you actually picked up the album? Like, had you heard anything or was this like a blind purchase for you? Uh, so the music video again and again was my first introduction. I probably had like red hype because, you know, there was Kerrang, there was Metal Hammer, there was so many magazines and they were my Bibles. That's how I discovered everything, particularly in Australia as well. When a lot of these bands, before they were signed, obviously were playing in America on the independent circuit, unsigned. We didn't get them over to Australia, so it was all magazine education for me. I was aware of Taproot, and then I saw the music video, and then the album came out, and I got the album. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, I would go to the music store, put the headphones on, listen to the album, and if the opening riff got me, you know, it had to be such a good opening riff. And then I would follow through with the rest of the song, and if I enjoyed that first song, I would just buy the album. The opening riff of Smile, I mean, it's huge. It's amazing. That song ticks all the boxes. I think it's a perfect example of Mike DeWolf's, you know, signature sound, huge, crunchy guitar tones, and the vocals as well. It's got a bit of everything vocal-wise as well. And the end of the song, it's just an amazing, perfect, kind of Deftone-esque type of ending riff. So, yeah, I was hooked, man, after hearing this song. <laughs> Yeah, I mean right. it's it's a hell of a way to start the record out. I, I think they I think the track listing in this, whoever laid this out did it perfectly, I think. Yeah, the sequencing is very, very well done. And yeah. to start with a to start with a straight guitar note, and then he almost whispers before they go in full on full volume, right? That is a it, 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 David said it's a powerful statement 
right? And and this, I so I put this on while I was working, and I noticed this, uh, and I had it on repeat, and I would always catch myself. I'm tapping my foot, and I'm like, "What am I?" Ta- oh, because I, you, you get sucked in. It's a well written song. Um, I find myself singing along. My my notes were holy shit the riff, and then I have a note here for a four piece band, right? They have a very very full sound. Yeah. Like sometimes you you'll notice that when there's not a second guitarist, you're left a little bit wanting. But I, I don't know. Maybe it's the mixing. Uh, it could be a, it could be a um it could be attributed to this musicianship of the band, or it could be the mix. But it sounds very full for a four piece. Which remember in the days of new metal, everybody was a five piece, a six yeah. piece, a nine piece, right? So they they brought a very big sound with a standard four member band. Yeah, the, the, this song definitely sets the tone for the record. Yeah, totally. So we come out of Smile, and then we go to Again and Again, 3 minutes, 55 seconds. And I believe this was the first single off first the single. album, yep. right? Yep. Um, I think, out of, out of, uh, I'm looking at my notes here, out of all the songs this album, this probably made the most sense as a lead-off single because it, it hits all the different pieces of their catalog. Um, but it's still friendly enough that, if you had heard this on the radio at that point, you wouldn't kind of, it wouldn't have been a, a reach, right? Yeah. It wouldn't be like, you know, it wouldn't be like you're listening to pop music and then Cannibal Corpse comes on, right? It was, it kind of fit the milieu of the time. Um, I had the same thing written down. It was a radio hit that wasn't a radio hit. <laughs> yeah. I, that's what I think. I mean, it's, it's super singable. Uh, I that, that's well, a big thing with this record for me is like, I like to, when I'm alone, think I'm a singer kind of thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and this so is one of records that, like, you think you can really, like, do it to. And, like, they're, this is one of the more memorable songs on this record. Like, it's, when you hear it again, you're like, oh, yeah, I know why I love this record. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is one of the reasons why. Especially that chorus. I mean, it's it's super catchy, and it's top, top-notch songwriting for that era, I think. In hindsight, Tim, does it pass the second song test? Oh, hell yeah. Definitely. So, David, uh, we, we have that whole, we, Tim and I have this idea that fast forward the first song, go right to the second. And the second song will tell you if the album is good or not, because everybody puts their first song. Their first song is always the lead off banger. Um, David, I want to ask you this, which is kind of kind of off topic. Um, you talked about how you found this band through watching your version of MTV, right? What other bands did you find solely based upon the music video? What ones stick out in your mind from that era? Well, the biggest one, the most life-changing one, I was a bit of a late starter with Deftones. I had heard the name, but I actually saw the music video for Change in the House of Flies. That just completely changed my world, uh, <laughs> catastrophically. And then I went back, got obsessed with Around the Fur, got obsessed with Adrenaline, and then White Pony eventually came out as an album, and then I got that. Yeah, that's the biggest one, for sure. You were talking also about the vocals and like it's one of those bands or one of those songs that you know makes you sing at home thinking you could be in a band yeah i actually thought i could be in a band in 1999 i started a new metal band called fake and uh it was born because i was seeing these bands with people that were 16 17 getting signed playing with their mates and I thought, oh, I can do that. Steven, uh, the vocalist of Taproot, was a huge influence on me trying to be a, a vocalist because I thought his voice was just so awesome. <laughs> it is wild. It is wild. It's, very, so what, yeah, it's definitely very unique. So what happened, David? Did Fake ever get off the ground, or did it? Was it a? It was a typical um, over exuberant uh, early teenage experiment. Yeah, more the latter. <laughs> <laughs> we played shows in our local area and in Brisbane. It was a, a really thriving skate park scene at the time. So we played lots of skate shows and little festivals and at some Brisbane venues. But it was definitely more just about trying to write new metal songs with my best friends. I realized quickly I wasn't a singer, but I just really, that was the way I could express myself at the time. New metal gave me a voice, you know, it gave me a vessel to really have the confidence to start exploring myself and finding my identity. Yeah, then I thought, oh, I can start doing this myself with my own new metal songs. And so it was just a lot of fun, really. 
but it didn't really go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, but you had the you had the experience. You had the the fun doing it, which is which yeah, is yeah. You tried, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So being that again and again was the song that you know introduces you to them. I'm assuming this is a very special track for you, then. Um, it is for me. There's better tracks on the album, but I agree yeah. absolutely with everything you said. As a second song, it ticks that box. Two songs in, it's so strong that then you know you're in hook, line, and sync into this album because track one, track two are bangers. And I completely agree with everything you said in terms of how it's such a well-written, compacted song. It makes sense that it's the single. It's got a little bit of aggression to get those people in that like the screaming, that are anti-radio or whatever. But then it's got that huge hook and then it's got that bridge that brings it all back down, building it back up to the final chorus. It's an awesome song. And by me saying that it's not one of my favorites, it's just saying uh, it's not one of my favorites on a list of mm. really strong songs okay. that I love. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the next song for me is, I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's one of them. Well, let's go into it. So track three, Emotional Times. Three minutes, three seconds. Tim, start us off. Yeah, like I said, one of, if not my favorite track on the record. Absolutely love the chorus in this song. Um, it, it, it's the song that gets stuck in my head constantly after hearing it. Because I mean the groove in the song though is what is what grabs me. But the, the drumming and the bass section in this song is especially um important for me and why I like this record because I believe that a lot of people don't talk about the drums and the bass in this band. If you go if you really go and listen to it in the in this record, it was super, super put up in the mix. And I think that it, whoever thought of that because because you guys know, you don't really hear the bass guitar anymore. No, the rhythm section is typically buried. Yeah. Yeah. In this record, though, the, whoever mixed it, they, they did a fantastic job of highlighting that. And I, I'm a big, big fan of that. And I think this song definitely puts that peak for me with the rhythm section, if that makes sense to you guys. No, that makes sense. Um, I have almost the same notes. I have a, this is one of... Uh, I said the chorus in this is instantly memorable. Oh, yeah. And the the extended, the wah, ah, 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 I mean, that is where I had it playing and I would I caught myself actually singing along and I was stupidly, I was on a meeting, but I didn't have myself on mute. And, um, you know, they're they're talking about like, you know, work shit and I'm sitting there going, ah, 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 ah. they're like, Jay, you okay? I'm like, <laughs> uh, my audio must be clipping. I'm sorry, everybody. But I mean, yeah, it's, it's a well, it's a well done song. Um, the course is instantly memorable, but I will say this. This is where I have a note where I, I have um, second time through listening album. This is where I start noticing structure can get repeating. Yeah. So I listened to the album once and on the second listen, it's this track where I put my ear kind of went, huh, what's going on? Definitely. Well, what were your thoughts, David? Well, I actually had as well, super strong chorus. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this song has massive chorus. I completely agree with that. Strong vocals all around. I like the tranquil bridge on the song. It kind of takes you away to another place. It's a little bit psychedelic and it builds back to, you know, a huge crushing riff. When the song starts, the life sucks sometimes. That bit with the kind of programmed loop almost sounds a little bit comical to me with his voice. Mm. <laughs> oh, I, did, I gotta go back and hear that. I never, I didn't think about that, but he's right. He's definitely right. Yeah, right. So, I mean, so, so, so far we're three tracks in and we've had, we haven't had a bad one yet. Let's look at tra track number four, which is now three minutes, four, 21 four seconds. bangers in a row. The, another really? banger right here. Oh yeah. You I like this, this one? I love what this are, track. What are your thoughts, David? Now? Well, so you were talking about how Drag Down was one of the songs that was written for this session and all the other songs had been written before. I had read that it was Drag Down and also this song now, only two songs written for Gift. You know what? I might have I might have read over that. Let me see. <laughs> it's keep like keep, said keep it. talking though. <laughs> let me look. I could be wrong as well. <laughs> oh yeah, you know what? Except for drag down and now, you're you're 100 correct. My bad. No, not at all, man. Uh, so I was kind of like listening to it in that headspace, seeing if there was a big difference in style and execution. This song, I think, still is really solid, but out of the three preceding it, it's probably the weakest. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. It's a good track though. 
the stop start of the you know like that bit kills it that's awesome <laughs> yeah, yeah that's my note here my note here is uh the chorus is an earworm yeah Right, you can hear like when you just did it. I heard that riff in my head, the the, the staccato notes. It, you can't help but forget it, and that's what makes it kind of stand out. Right here, I am out of one side of my mouth saying that I'm, I'm noticing that the song structure is getting repetitive, but then you go back and you listen to that song, and that part is instantly just jumps right out at you, jumps out of your headphones. Yeah, and then you go to number five and you get another banger. I mean, this so, is yeah number five is one night stand three minutes 39 seconds yep. uh i said my notes are this is the best intro on the album typical new metal opener yeah yeah and i said the layered singing screaming in the chorus actually seals the song for me that was the note i took away here and then uh what is it once again i have proven my strength to myself on my own and then the last refrain where he screams <laughs> and sings and then he hits that extended um, well, like I, I can't fuck, I just killed people's ears. They were like, Jesus, Jay, don't ever do that again. Um, but he hits that note and it, it was different because it's the first time he does, does it on the album, but it fit perfectly. It fit yeah, perfectly. There's this song right here. I noticed being a guitar player, you, 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 you tend to listen to stuff differently sometimes. And this is one of the tracks that really, really engages me because the way that they do the guitar swells in the chorus and stuff and, who, who who's the guitar player's name again? You guys said it. Mike DeWolf. There you go. I, I was watching some videos of him. He does a lot of like he does have the power chords in there, but he adds a lot of other notes with his chords. And you can always hear the ambience in the music he writes. And I think any guitar player that can make ambience with just one guitar. I mean, he doesn't even have someone backing him up and he makes crazy ambient sounding chords. And I think this song is a huge, huge part of why this band was successful at the time because the guitar part, the guitar was just very, very uniquely written. And I, I really I really just get excited when I hear that kind of stuff, being mm -hmm. a guitar player. And I noticed, I started, because when I was younger, I was only playing guitar for like two years at this point. But now that I'm 20 years in, it's like, oh, now I see what he was doing. Mm. And now you see why so many people ripped it off. <laughs> yeah. That's cool to hear that from your point of view, coming from playing guitar, because it's nice sometimes when you can hear something and you can feel yeah. it, but you don't come from that point of being a guitar player or a bass player or a drummer. So you can hear it articulated in another way. And yeah, I love that. I just had a two minutes, 25, that part of the song is probably my favorite moment on the album, the bridge. There's so many good bridges on this album, and uh, the bridge in this song would be one of my favorites. But I uh, completely agree with the guitar stuff you were talking about. That extra dynamic of atmosphere over the crunch, over the huge new metal riffs. Yep. One of the most appealing things about Taproot. And like Definitely. you said, the rhythm section, man, yeah, super underrated. It, it, yeah, exactly, man. I mean, there's the it, it it holds this record, man. Uh, Even I, on the the next yeah. song, it's huge and believed. I mean, it's. I, I think it's probably one of the best examples of it. I, I think rhythm, the, having a good rhythm section is almost a double-edged sword because like you said, it holds the whole band together because it dictates the pace. Yeah. But you run the risk of being so good that it almost kind of fades away because if you're that good, if you're in the pocket, if you're, if you're supporting the lower end of the song and keeping the rhythm, people almost don't even notice, right? Like it's almost like taken for granted that, yeah, the timing is, is spot on. They're not rushing. They're not dragging. They're just, they're in where they need to be. I mean, I so, mean, think about it now. If you guys, if you guys like sit here for a moment and think about what I'm about to say, the first three, four Deftones records, what really held them records together was Abe and she. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Especially in White Pony. The, the groove in White Pony is fucking amazing to this day. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't get much better groove than that with them two, I, I think, personally. I mean, yeah, he's, he's um, a great drummer, like, just horribly overlooked, but he's a great yeah. drummer. I mean, I've said it a million times. They're my favorite band, so obviously I'm going to think that. But when if you if you take that away from me, like me saying they're my favorite band, it's still some of the best rhythm section in that time era, in that era of time to me. And I think in this record you hear, too, I mean, 
Because then when you think about it, they went out with Deftones, right? Uh, yeah, well, you and I were at that show. We didn't even know each other. It yeah, was out at the so, Tower Theater. Yeah, yeah. so this, I'm assuming that they heard, they hear Deftones in part. You have to pretty much admit that some of their sound comes from Deftones. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, that's what I, it's just in my opinion, I would think that so. well, Deftones influenced everybody coming out for a good five, 10 year mark. Right. And then especially White Pony came out and they literally reinvented themselves and rewrote the entire they rewrote that entire game. Um, yeah. David, I, I did want to ask you while slightly aside, what is the best band you've ever seen live? <laughs> oh, um, OK, for me. Amen. Big day out. Really? Crazy, crazy you said that because we just had John on and he said how great that show was. Yeah, dude. I worked with John. I made a documentary with Snot in the UK when they were playing with Korn. Korn were doing their self-titled album from back to front and played Daddy for the first time since it kind of was made. Oh, shit. <laughs> and uh, became friends with Mikey Doling and through that, like, I got to meet John as well. So I'm keen to check out that podcast because, yeah, John's a really cool guy, of course, with Snot and Amen. That show, Big Day Out, man, I was at peak Amen obsession. And I made myself an Amen shirt. As soon as the gates opened to the festival, I went straight down to the bar and just waited at the front. Yeah, I was just like this, you know, teenage kid, completely obsessed with music. And Amen weren't a new metal band. But with Ross Robinson, Indigo Ranch, Roadrunner Records, they kind of were being promoted under the new metal umbrella. So they came into my world and there was just something about them that clicked with me. Probably the Ross and the Indigo Ranch thing. I was just super into that vibe. And seeing them live, man, I mean, I'll, I'll say it straight up. Like, I cried. I was like a fangirl. I just had this outer body experience. And I guess that has to be my favorite concert experience of all time. I got to meet Casey Chaos after the show. I like climbed a fence and I saw him a hundred meters away. I'm like, Casey, Casey. <laughs> I was embarrassing, <laughs> man. But that, uh, the power of music, you know, it really means something to you. And these people are the face of that. So you really feel, especially back when you're a kid, you feel like you know them or they know you because the music resonates with you so much. So yeah. Amen. Big day out. I know were, exactly what you're yeah. saying about that because yesterday I was driving home from work and one of the dudes who I'm friends with now from my other podcast texts me all the time like, how you doing? Here's another song we just did. And I'm like, dude, the dude who wrote one of my top five records fucking text messages me. Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking amazing, dude. And it's like you said, like music is like, it's like that, man. Because I tell a lot of people that like, like I can't believe like we're talking to you right now. You know what I mean? And then it's like, yeah. And then I get a text message like, yo, just wondering how you're doing. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just cool to me, man, to, like, that you can get these kind of connections just through music. So uh, I hear Amen. exactly what you're saying, yeah. man. Amen is one of those interesting bands. They're almost like an enigma to us Americans because they're an American band, but they were huge in Europe. They were big in Australia. They were big everywhere but here. A lot like um, an analog would be like a doggy dog in the mid-90s. Yep. Or even like, I mean, I hate to say it, but to bands like sick of it all like they do huge in europe and then for here they're kind of like slept on and i yeah. never kind of i never quite understood why never quite understood why yeah it's it is weird yeah coming from australia because like of course they were an american band the whole roadrunner ross robinson i just imagined or presumed that they were huge in america it was only until more recently i found out that they didn't really have much of a fan base in the country they were from yeah <laughs> Yeah, John John explains some of that in the episode. You'll yeah, hear that. Yeah. Yeah, he said he spent, you know, entire entire months over in Europe and then it, it just come home and it was like kind of just forgotten. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I want right, so I want to get back to Believe though cuz I think that this is my favorite track on the record. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah. Why? I I the rhythm section in this. I think I love the chorus again. Another sh I I say it constantly, you have to write good choruses. This is a fucking the best chorus on the record in my opinion and i just think it's it's one of the songs that i go back and hit hit it again hit it again oh. that's just in my opinion i know me and jay are always different with the song <laughs> stuff so it's boring if everyone agrees <laughs> it, yeah, it, it, exactly yeah, yeah my I note mean, here is you could have cut this <laughs> oh wow. wow see it does not surprise me at all i completely agree with the chorus thing uh this is my brother's favorite chorus on the album and one of his favorite taproot choruses 
It's probably one of my favourites on the album, for sure. Another epic bridge, vocally, riff-wise, just with his yep. interplay between the singing, screaming technique he does. It's highlighted really well on the bridge here. So, I wouldn't cut yeah. this song. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, don't, yeah, you can't cut this one. See, it doesn't surprise me, Jay. That yeah, because Tim and I's taste are like oil and water, which is kind of funny. But I would cut the next song, actually, I... <laughs> okay, it's the so, weakest song on the record. You're definitely right. See, see, me and David are on the same page with so, this record. Uh, wait a minute. So hold on, hold on with I. Let's do let's do meant to be. Um I find so my note here was this is by far the most aggressive, straight through aggressive song on the album. Like this kicks in and he screams almost the whole thing. And it's it it I found it and my note here was interesting that they would bury this as the first track on what typically would be the B-side. Right, because usually one to six is side A, seven to twelve is side B, and this is the basically the first track on the B side. Now, some bands purposefully did that. I mean, the best example I can think of at the top of my head is Pantera's "Far Beyond Driven." The lead-off track on slide B is "Slaughtered," which is one of their heaviest songs. Yeah. But I, I, the my the funny note I have here about the song is when I bought this album, I couldn't figure out what a mentobe was. Cause I'm looking at the title. I'm going, what the fuck is a mentobe? And then I listen to it and I go, Oh, meant to be. Oh, I feel like a jackass. So yeah. That exciting. sounds like something I would do. <laughs> exciting I would adventure. do that right now. Exciting adventures in the English language. David, what are your thoughts? Yeah. The first thing I have is holy shit. That opening riff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it's, it's got good riffing in it, but I think this is, at this point, for me, the most, the least memorable for me, and it's probably, it's not one that I would skip, but it's one that I wouldn't be mad if it did get skipped. I think okay. it's the weakest song so far, in my opinion. Okay, okay. Um, so that takes us to, I think this is the one song we probably all agree with, track number eight, which I think is the longest track in the album. No, comeback is four minutes, 15 seconds, I. So you Dude. said cut it, Tim. David said cut it. I even said cut it. And yet this was their second single. Yeah. Oh, no, no. We don't want to cut this one. I love this song. Oh, no. You don't want to cut this? Is this just no. me? You we, guys were don't want to cut... we were calling about men meant to be. Oh, you guys want to cut Mentobe. Okay, yeah. I get it. No, no. <laughs> hang on. I made a mistake because I didn't realize Mentobe was next. I want to cut I. I like Mentobe. <laughs> oh, no, shit. So really? David and I, you're outnumbered, Tim. So, Tim, make your case. Uh, dude, how, how do you not get I hate myself sometimes? I love myself. How do you not get that stuck in your head? <sighs> This was the second single, right? Or yep. what? Yep. Right? Yeah. Doesn't surprise me at all. One of my favorites on the record. Cool. I mean, it gets stuck in your head. It's highly singable. I, I just love songs that are highly singable and get stuck in your head. I think it's just, if, if it stays with me, I love it. And songs like, like meant to be that I'm just like, eh, you know, whatever. Okay. You know? But I, I think on this, I think on this song too, I keep going back to the drums because I, I, I think that, it's the most powerful in this song. And I think it's in, you know, it's an integral part of this record. Like I keep saying, it's the drumming in the, in the bass. And I think in this song, it's one of the most powerful points of that. Awesome. It's just crazy that you guys think that because I think if they had a different drummer, this whole record, like we said, is just different, you know? Okay. Uh, what were your thoughts, David? I just had probably my least favorite song from gift. <laughs> Wow, I'm very yeah, surprised. So at that. We're, in, we're in agreement. We're in agreement there. That's kind of it's kind of funny. Okay, so now let's hop ahead to the next track, which is track number nine, three minutes, ten second, mirrors reflection. I have my note here is by far this is the best chorus on the album. This is the this chorus is the for most death tone song on this record. Yeah, the the sometimes I would give anything to be something more, right? Like I mean, and and, and you know what we haven't talked about yet so far is his lyrics, because his lyrics are fairly interesting in the sense that they're they're aggressive, but they're insightful. And a lot of it is it, it kind of, you kind of get the sense that he's unpacking his own head, right? Like I love myself. I hate myself. Or um, sometimes I, I would give anything to be something more, or um, once again, I prove my strength to myself on my own. Like there is almost kind of this like hate breedy motivational quality to it. And, and which, which delivered in a way that, you know, you would not compare him to Jamie Johnson in any way, shape or form. Yeah, no, absolutely not. No. Well, what did you have for notes, Tim? Um, I, I think he channels his inner Chino on this song. Um, I, this is why this is one of them songs where I think, yeah, this fits why they put them out with Deftones. It's, you know, you get the, the comparisons in this one. I, I think 
this track is pretty weak until the chorus. The chorus is fucking great. And and, and we all know if you can't write a chorus, you can't write anything. Yep. So yep. And uh, just like David's been saying, you, you have to have good bridge parts and pre-choruses as well. There, yeah. there comes a point where if you don't have a solid bridge, like you don't get a you don't get a part where the song completely changes in your head and where the atmosphere changes. If you don't have that, I think it kind of makes a lot of shit weak, but these guys do it perfectly on this record as well. So I, I hundred percent agree with you, David, with the bridge part stuff. Uh, cool. Yeah. I think uh, this album has so many great bridges for sure. I actually had that. This is one of my more favorite songs. Okay. Mainly coming to the vocal thing. Like you were talking about, like his vocal play on this song is a lot of fun. He does a lot of things. Yeah, the bridge at 219 is one of my favorite riffs on the album, I think, as well. It has a really awesome, odd drumming pattern as the riff keeps progressing. Jared's drums keep almost seeming like they're going a slightly out of time or offbeat, and I think uh, the drums on this are really good. Yeah, definitely. It's it's I, I it's crazy because as the record keep goes like further, because like we said before, a lot of new metal records like they start to fall off around track seven. Yeah, I mean, but this record keeps it's still going. It, it yeah. keeps it up. Yeah, it, it's impressive, man. You got me reflecting even more. Like I mentioned, I is my least favorite, but it's not saying it's a bad song. You know what I mean? I keep coming back to that. It's just mm -hmm. for me one of the weakest songs of a really good batch. We're this far into the album, and it's so solid still. Really, it's a good album. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for definitely. a debut. And that's the other thing for a major label debut, right? Like it's, it's solidly built I, again, two years earlier, they would have been, they would have been massive. Uh, so coming off of the back of mirrors reflection, we have uh, number 10 dragged down three minutes, 30 seconds. Uh, David, I'm going to start with you. What were your thoughts? What did your notes have to say? Well, um, mirrors reflection ends so suddenly. And then I love how Steven just goes, and then it just, bam, we're in, we're into the next song. That, is a really, really cool way to begin a song. Yeah, we talked about how this was one of two songs that was specifically written for this album. And I think this is a solid song. It has really cool verse and chorus. I think this is another chorus that really highlights how some of the riffs that Taproot have are really so fat and so heavy in a way that sometimes they can sound a bit noteless and Stephen is really mm. great at still creating a melody that is really dynamic, really hooky. Yeah, I think the chorus in this song is another really great example highlighting his ability to make really great hooks. And then, yeah, he has great aggressive vocals on the bridge, which then he continues overlaying those over the final chorus. So this song has like a lot of really good things going on and a lot of dynamic. It's the only song on the record where the whole band starts out at once. Ah, if you go back and listen. No shit. I got to go back and listen song. to it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My note here was this is um, this is to me where the, I noticed the bass. The bass riff is very prevalent. And I drew a big heart next to it. So it's very up in the mix. It's very, pre and I believe it's a kind of like, a, if I recall, it's a quasi galloping sort of beat. Um, yeah. I, I think the bass guitar is one of those instruments where it's best when you sut, sut, subtly, subtly, however you say that. Um, but if you are going to make it pronounced, you have to make it unique. And right here, it's pronounced and it's unique and it really fits the song, right? Yeah. Because if you think about it, when you go back and listen to the rest of the album, uh, specifically with bass in mind, it doesn't, it, it sits solidly in the pocket. This is the first song to me where it popped out where I'm like, ah, he's got his own, he's got his own riff runway for lack of a better term. Yeah, I, I, I do think that the record could have ended on this track, though. I don't really think you need to go any further, but labels didn't really allow that back at this time. You had to put out 13, 14 songs. So. Which is kind of crazy, right? Thinking about now where most bands, you know, I, I when you think of the bands that are consistently putting out an album every other year, right? Um, especially in this in our in the extreme music space. Well, who is that? That's Cannibal Corpse. It's Black Dahlia Murder. Um, it's more of your metal friendly bands. It's 10 songs. It's always 10 songs. Yep. I thought this album was a little long. Truth be told, I have a note here <laughs> which says if you had made this an, a seven song EP, it would have been an absolute monster because <laughs> I think I would have cut some of the extra. I know that's like mind blowing to say, but I would have cut some of the extra, some of the stuff that I think is, is filler. So before we go into 
comeback. I want to ask David. So David, you alluded to this earlier, right? So you do videos and stuff. Can we talk a little bit more about that? Like what, what do you do besides podcast host? I guess is my question. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I have a video production business called Her Name is Murder Productions. It was founded in Brisbane, Australia, 2009. Yeah. I went to film school. I always wanted to make movies. When I was a kid, I saw Broken Arrow, the John Woo movie on the drive-in theater and the train was exploding at the end of the movie. And as that was happening, I kid you not, like a shooting star fell from the sky above the screen. And I saw that and I just thought, I want to make action movies. <laughs> As I got older, that turned into wanting to make music videos and work with bands because I really got into music. And so, yeah, I started this business to do that. I was lucky enough to work around Australia for about five years before moving overseas. And moving overseas was fantastic because it gave me the ability to have more chance to work with the bands that I really grew up with. The bands that I had their posters on my bedroom wall and would play air guitar to like Snot and Sepultura and stuff like that. So yeah, I've just been really fortunate in that respect to be able to live out my passion of music through my work. And we do music videos and music documentaries. And then, like I said, because of COVID happening and a lot of stuff being shut down, that's when the podcast was born. But essentially, like, my main baby is Her Name is Murder. But I have to say, after doing the podcast for one year, they've kind of, like, evened out a bit now. Like, I, I really enjoy the podcast and it presents me certain opportunities that are a bit easier to obtain than it is trying to work with bands on a music video, music documentary level. I get a lot from the podcast, but I also still get a lot from what I do with Her Name Is Murder. So I'm not complaining at all. Like I'm in a very, very fortunate position to be able to kind of be doing still, you know, after 10 years, what I love, which is working with bands and music. Hell yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that's fucking awesome. Man, I would love to do this kind of shit. You imagine getting paid for doing this, Tim, how awesome that would be, right? Right. I would never put on a fucking pair of pants again. It'd be great. You sit in your shorts the whole time. Uh, so now we're coming to what I think is the best song on the album. Track number wow. 11, Come Back, wow. uh, which is long, four minutes, 25 seconds. Yeah, the, to me, this is the best uh, song on the album. And I, I think it's... I just want to say I completely agree with you. It's my favorite too. There we wow. go, Tim. There we go. You're, you're out. You're outnumbered. You're off the island. Wow. Um, <laughs> I think I think it's a, it's a multitude of reasons. It's that quiet, almost electronic intro right? Um, and then the guitar creeps in. I think the chorus is beautiful, right? Because um, he screams and he sings and he hits some extended notes. And then there's the pinch harmonics in the background and then the riffing. And it's, I just, I think I personally would have picked this and closed the album with this mm. because the next song, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what the next song sounded like if you put a gun to my head, because after this song ends and it goes into impact, I always went back and went right to this again because I really just enjoyed it. So David, you agree with me. What were your thoughts? Cool. Well, I've got here, yeah, probably my favorite song. If I had to pick and we are picking, I would agree. Comeback <laughs> is my favorite. I think the song has a lot of dynamic, a lot of ebbs and flows. I really like also around the two minute 20 mark when the pre-chorus is repeated, it becomes heavy and really lifts. I think that bit is just... Really, really tasty. Also has another great bridge. It's just a good song. He, <laughs> if, you, if you guys look, go back and listen to this, he channels his inner Fred Durst in this one, I think. You think? Okay. Yeah, th this song also has an incubus science feel to me. When I listen to it, I'm like, this sounds like a, an incubus science tr track to me. I, I think really? that I also think this is the most new metal song on this record. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Hands down. It's not a bad track. I'm just very surprised that you guys think it's the best one. But hey, I mean, everyone's got their opinion. So what, just, what were your notes, Tim? I, I just, just what I just said. He, he channels <laughs> his inner Fred Jay is going to say and, this is the best track on the album. <laughs> yeah, I just, like I said, I think it's got the incubus science feel to it. If you go back and listen to it, especially in the pre-chorus part, you could definitely hear that in there. And then it's just, like I said, it's in my opinion, the most new track on the record. Yeah, it's, it's easily, easily my favorite. Um, and funnily enough, whenever I, when I got the album out, when I knew we were going to do this deep dive and I went back and listened to it, I started with this song because I'm like, I remember that being my favorite song. Let me try it again. And I went, yep, still my favorite song because I hadn't heard this in however many years. So 
Track 12, uh, which was the final track on the first initial release of this album, which was Impact, two minutes, 49 seconds. I literally have no notes. It just says, Jay, go back and listen to Come Back Again. That's yeah, literally is, my notes. This is the weakest track on the record for me. Okay. Um, you think? Yeah. I, I don't even think this, this song needs to be on the record, honestly. I think it's super boring. I don't, I don't really care for it at all. I can understand uh, what you're saying. And in parts, I agree. When it begins to when it yeah. ends, it keeps moving quite fast. It packs a punch. It's pretty compact. And he name drops the album in it on the chorus. He says, it's my gift. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it feels more like a B-side. Yeah, yeah, I, pre- I, I, I feel the same way. If, speaking of B-sides, there's a note thing here that says they have other songs that were, that were going to be on this record. One called Thrift Tour, Strive and Get Me. And apparently... They were put out. You can find them on like file sharing. So I'm assuming Soul Seek has them. Also, along with Day by Day, they re- they later released as a 2018 box set called Besides. So I guess uh, people that collect that stuff can have that. And mm-hmm. you can probably find them tracks on YouTube, I'm assuming as well, which I'm going to look for now because I didn't even know they existed, to tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah, that whole um, that whole first album is on uh what was it something more than nothing is on youtube that's where i found that that billy ocean <laughs> cover it's like oh, buried okay. in the middle of the album which is kind of it's kind of kind of wild um and and like and like tim just alluded to there is uh there was a japanese bonus track it showed up on the dracula 2000 soundtrack it was day by day it's solid song but i think you're right in the statement of it's a solid b-side yeah Definitely. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit, David. So uh, aside from all this new metal stuff, what else do you listen to? Are there any newer bands, any, uh, anything else that um, we should be checking out? I mean, being as you're in the Netherlands and you're in Australia, right? Is there anything local that we should be aware of or what, uh, what other stuff is of late is catching your ear? Well, I'd like to mention a band that uh, isn't around at the moment, but they do link to this album in terms of working with Ulrich Wild because he uh, mixed this particular EP. It's by an Australian band, probably, our, well, I'll say personally, our best new metal band, but easily one of the best. They're called Sunk Lodo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, their debut EP called Society Anxiety was mixed by Ulrich Wild, and uh, it's like a banger. They're such a great band. Anyone that's like our age and from back when the new metal boom was happening, they're considered Australian royalty stemming from that scene. And awesome. any listeners out there from your podcast or American fans haven't heard of Sunk Lodo and are into, you know, the bands we're talking about and this music, I would say check them out for sure. And you interviewed them, didn't you, David? Like you had them on in one of your early episodes, right? It was really cool, man, because when I was talking about my band Fake and being inspired by kids that were 16... That was Sunk Lodo I was talking about. They got signed to Sony Music at the average age of 16. The drummer was 13. And <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, it's crazy, dude. And I saw that, and that's what inspired me. And so for the one-year anniversary of the podcast, I was able to get the guitarist onto the podcast to celebrate 22 years of that EP, Society Anxiety. And for me, that was like a dream come true because that band means so much to me but also to so many people in Australia. That was a really fun one for me, for sure. Luke McDonald, yeah, that's he's awesome. a cool guy. Yeah, That's Damn, awesome. 13 is crazy. That's, that's kind of nuts, right? right. That's kind of nuts. Well, well we, just, um, we just talked to Crossbreed last night, and they were talking about how you know, they were all friends, and they got signed, and their first major tour was with Rammstein. And, and the, the James kept saying, he's like, imagine like, being on tour, your first major tour, you're opening for Rammstein. And you're all just like sitting there looking around like, holy shit, is this real? Yeah. Like this can't be real. Yeah. Luke was telling me how um, in 1998, Vans Warped Tour came to Australia and Deftones were on it and they were playing for Around the Fur. Sunk Lodo were playing. Uh, they weren't called Sunk Lodo at the time. They were called Messiah. And Chino saw them and he really liked them. And he told the head guy of Vans Warp, put them on more shows, put them on more shows. They did that. And then Chino asked them if they would then play a 15-minute opening set for the Around the Fur show in Brisbane. Chino Marino had this massive role in really kind of putting Sunk Lodo on the map, which is really cool. And so, like, all that happened. The band had gone to Sydney to record their debut EP with one of Australia's biggest producers at the time. And the guitarist had only just turned 15. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. It's very nice of him to do that, though. 
Yeah, it's really cool. That is kind of wild. That is really wild. Um, when I th- see when I think of like Australian bands, I think of, uh, I think of King Parrot. I think of um, uh, what is it? Psychoptic? Psychoptic Australian? Tim? They are New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. New Zealand. <laughs> New Zealand, like Russell Crowe, for example, he's New Zealand, but we're like, oh, he's Australian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's pretty much it's pretty much the same thing, right? Yeah, close close enough, close enough. Um, uh, who you, else? What, what, you have that little island that right off of Australia too. Is it like Tongue? Ta- Tasmania. Tasmania. There you go. Yeah. What's the other band I think of? Oh, D's Nuts. I fucking love yeah. that band. And I say yeah, that, and people great. are like, "Wait, but that's a real band." I'm like, "Yo, Binge and Purgatory is a fucking great album. That's a, that's I, a banger. I, it is just." catchy track after track after track after track after track like and i think they do you know they don't come to the states much though they do a lot of australia and a lot of europe yeah. but i think the only time they the only time they did the states was the warp tour i think okay yeah did you know um that the singer jj he was the drummer from i killed the prom queen yes yes okay and- you guys have confession over there too which i really like yeah confession it's so good yeah confession i enjoy crafter the singer way more in confession like for me ultimate prom queen was with the english singer ed butcher when they did the album music for the recently deceased that's where it's at for me i love it oh dude say goodbye gets i love that song (laughs) yeah a fucking amazing song man i haven't dug that out in ages now i know what i'm listening to tomorrow (laughs) another one that gets stuck in your head that's a good metalcore album for sure. Absolutely. I gotta, I gotta definitely dig that one out. Well, all right. So let's um I, I know oh, it's, no, it's, well, let's let's on. do the thing here before yeah, because it is getting late. Um <laughs> out of ten. Let, let's do it. Uh I'll start. I for me, this is an eight point five all around. I think this record is very memorable. I I will listen to it way, way more. It's it's an eight point five for me out of ten. How about you, uh David? Straight away I thought eight. So I'm gonna go with eight. I think out of ten. I think in its current state, you give it a seven. I would give it a seven. I think if you shave maybe two songs off it, eight and a half, nine, easy. Yeah. Nice. And and the more I, the more that we've talked through my, and that I've talked through it with you guys, talked through my notes, I really am convinced. Two years earlier, this would have been like massive, like because they were they were introducing that. Um, I don't want to say mellifluous, but they were introducing that earworm sort of approach to new metal. That by this time stuff like disturbed and that that early stage like breaking benjamin all that was starting to break so they were kind of like the odd man out because they weren't like so radio friendly but yeah i'm convinced two years earlier this would be huge and like most Definitely. of bod stuff two years later they would have been huge. you know just bad bad timing well just poor choice just you know the way the world worked the way the world yeah. worked um all right so i think we're, we're hitting up on time so i want to get us out of here but i want to ask david um, obviously we're going to link to your show in the show notes. Uh, if people want to find you, they want to get in touch. They want to keep track of what you're doing. Where do they go? Yeah. Everything is just, uh, with the forward slash life is peachy podcast. So that's the same with the Instagram. There's a Facebook page as well. I do most of the stuff on just the Instagram from there. You can find links to check out the podcast. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so on behalf of, on behalf of Tim, myself, David, I want to thank you for coming on. This has been really, really fun. Uh, this is hopefully the first in many type episodes we get to do again um there's plenty more new metal to dive through uh, on behalf of uh, david tim and myself i want to thank all of you watchers listeners for tuning in and listening once again instagram twitter the facebook group new breed underscore podcast you know where to find us um check out our youtube channel i will say because we are starting to do some uh reaction vids and some listening and we might actually go back and do some old videos too some old uh some old new metal reaction stuff so uh check us out give us a listen please follow david's podcast it's a really really fun listen and until next time this is new breed saying peace yeah i just want to say thanks you guys rule <laughs> thanks for having me oh, <laughs> thank, thank you yeah dude thank you man appreciate the invite sorry to like stuff the ending up but i was like i didn't get to say thank you oh, no, no oh no no, no you're no, fine no. man <laughs> what at all yeah don't worry about it yeah all right really appreciate it